So good morning. I know it's a surprise that I'm here on time. Even Dr. Serenik is standing up, so don't worry about that part. He's going to put in the book. So it's uh, my pleasure to welcome um, our visiting professor, Dr. Clem Darling from Albany. Um, he's had an environmental shock when he came here. He was in the pool last night. <laughs> All the Texans thought he was mad, but for a New Yorker with first snow, the pool is still very warm, so, so that's been great. So Clem, Clem um, is a professor of surgery at the University of Albany. He's a chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery and director of the Institute for Vascular Health and Disease, and it's actually the largest vascular surgery private group in the United States, which does, uh, has a, both a fellowship and an integrated residency, has one of the largest and longest databases in the country. So when anybody hears about the, the Albany group, if they don't have less than 3,000 cases, it probably wasn't done there because they've gone back so far. And they have a, um, a unique and a, a remarkable commitment both to training and to academia. Um, Clem actually started as a search tech and then went on to uh, medical school in Cincinnati, residency at um, Harvard Deaconess, and then actually did his vascular fellowship at Albany and has stayed there. His father was a, a vascular surgeon who trained with Michael DeBakey. So Clem still remembers the visiting rites at the prison, which was called the ICU at uh, Methodist, where he would not be allowed to cross the yellow line but see pictures of his dad. There were no videos then, so it was only pictures during the seven days that he wasn't allowed to see him. And since that time, he's um, trained uh, 50, 60 residents. He's kept a lot of them. Um, they have 18 surgeons. Uh, 20, 21. 21 surgeons now. They cover 15 hospitals. They control all vascular surgery within 200 miles of Albany, New York, um, uh, both directly uh, with, at the main center, and they use a hub and spoke, very similar to how Strack has tried to set up trauma here. He's going to give us a talk today, which is pertinent to how we're building the, the vascular division here on acute aortic emergencies and the Albany experience. Um, he was our visiting professor uh, under, with Robert B. Rutherford um, at the Texas Vascular this weekend, and Robert Rutherford was one of the people who contributed to reporting standards and also the standards for vascular surgery with regard to aortas. So it's a very good synergy in that respect. So I'd ask you all to welcome Clem Darling, the uh, visiting professor. Thank you very much, Mark, and I think my, one of my greatest honors here is getting Mark here on time. Uh, um, it's really an honor to be back in, uh, in Texas again, actually. As Mark says, I have a fond memory from my time here when I was a kid. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about rupture aneurysms because that's what we kind of focus on when we set up our, our system. Um, we actually have run some, uh, a bunch of courses on how to set up a, a rupture system, especially for a large rural area, which is kind of where we, where we work. Our experience is about a, about a little over a thousand, it's kind of an old slide, but a little over a thousand ruptured aneurysms. Uh, we tend to do them retroperitoneal, which is considered heresy by most vascular surgeons, and do a lot of them, 75% uh, of them now endovascularly, and I'll kind of go through how we, how we develop that, that, that approach. Um, before I do that, I'll talk a little bit about what he mentioned. We, we started out when I was started in 1990 in one hospital with four surgeons, and then uh, we eventually expanded. And we were doing less than 50% of the vascular in, that ho in the Albany proper, which is not a very big town. And then eventually we developed a system where we have now have covered pretty much everywhere and get referrals from up to 200 miles or even over 200 miles away, even, even for serious aortic uh, um, emergencies. Uh, so my partner, I'm, I'm very happy my partners allowed me to come out to Texas and, uh, and talk to you. Um, so anyway, when you look at ruptured aneurysms, they're, they're, the, the concept of how you deal with them is pretty straightforward, whether it's open or endo. You know, you want to get rapid proximal aortic control to minimize visceral ischemia. Uh, about 30 percent of mortality for ruptured aneurysms comes from venous injuries when you're trying to dissect out the aortic neck, uh, either super celiac or super uh, or perirenal. Uh, so uh, we, we wanted to try to figure out a system where we could minimize that and hopefully improve the uh, the mortality data. But if you look at most of the uh, uh, mortality for ruptures, it really hasn't changed over 50 years. Uh, and it's somewhere between uh, 40 and uh, 70 percent. Now, one of the slides which I should have put in here is that we're also a big trauma center where, where we come from. And it has some of the better numbers for uh, survival and trauma. And uh, the mortality for being shot in the abdomen or the chest in New York State is about 10.8 percent. And they have a level one, level two, level three trauma system around this country. In, uh, in 
paradoxically, the mortality for ruptured aneurysm is about three to four times that. And we don't, we don't, have, we don't have an organized system. And actually, right now, I'm working with uh, the American College to start, try to set up a level one trauma designation or a vascular one trauma designation uh, for, for centers around the country. Uh, and this, some of the work in this is from Courtney Warner, who's one of my uh, colleagues who just joined us after her Zero and Five program in Dartmouth, and she's helping set that up. But if you look at these numbers, there's really, really has been no change over the past 50 years. Um, for all of you uh, residents and fellows, there are obviously multiple ways to approach the aorta. Uh, the classic way, where I was taught, was a transabdominal, um, and you just open the aneurysm up and uh, place a graft inside it using the Creech maneuver. We tend to sect it. There's also uh, stent grafts, which is probably the most common way now, about 75 to 80 percent of what we do. But we do, we go retroperitoneally, and that's been one of the uh, techniques we uh, borrowed from uh, Charles Robb up in Rochester, New York, and have really pioneered uh, and used it pretty much for everything uh, right now. Patients placed in the right lateral cubist position uh, with, um, with our, left arm, their left arm over, usually a 10th interspace incision. This is from one of the papers we did on ruptured aneurysms, and you can see the ruptured aneurysm over here. Uh, the ruptures tend to happen in the left uh, perirenal space uh, in the retroperitoneum, usually protected by germotis fascia, and that's why patients don't uh, tend to die right when they, when they first rupture. And if you look at some of the old data, uh, many people present with symptoms from a day to, to three days be, uh, after their rupture, uh, and uh, the hematoma seals off usually when they get somewhat hypotensive. Uh, people are afraid to do a retroperitoneal because they're afraid that you're going to get into the hematoma, but uh, um, if, if you know your anatomy, that's really not a, not a big problem. Uh, once you get, because as I mentioned, a lot of time the hematoma is encased between the aorta and the angiotis fascia, and if you elevate the kidney and ligate the lumbar branch left renal vein, you can go to the supraceliac aorta fairly quickly. Uh, there's a maneuver we do, which is if you slip your left hand up the side, once you get through the three muscles, you can actually glide your hand uh, on the uh, iliopsoas muscle behind the kidney and up to the diaphragm and take a uh, a medial turn on that, and you're right in the cruise of the diaphragm. So it does two things. It offers you the ability to put your hand on the aorta and uh, compress it against the backbone, but more importantly, it makes it allows you to look at the blood pressure because obviously anesthesia doesn't do that while you're while they're doing these operations sometimes. So it allows us to, to take some time, get control. You can usually finger dissect in that area also and uh, get a clamp on either just at the renals or uh, supraceliac. And then once, if you slip your finger behind the cruise of the diaphragm, you can actually, uh, actually cut with impunity laterally as long as you know where the renal artery is and you've already transected or, or identified the lumbar branch left renal vein. One of our fellows actually transected the left renal artery twice, which is now called the Chima procedure. Uh, but we try to avoid that at all possible. And the way you do that is by reflecting the uh, kidney medial, medial encephalad. And so if you see the left renal artery going straight up and down, you, you know you're in good, uh, anato good anatomic position for clamping. And then you can move the clamp down as, uh, as normal. And I really only present this just for educational reasons, because as I mentioned, most people think it's crazy to do the, this retroperitoneal. Uh, we tend to also transect uh, the aorta when we do everything in that way allows us to, especially when you're dealing with residents and fellows, to see the entirety of the aorta. Uh, it, when you're coming from the side, it minimize, the reason people don't transect it transabdominally is because you worry about the lumbar veins. But if you're coming from the sides, you can identify the lumbar veins very easily, as well as the lumbar arteries. And of course, I presented this data, speaking of the Rutherford lecture, at, at Frank V's meeting once, and Dr. Rutherford got up and told me I was insane. So I took that as a great honor, even though he's a, he's a, he's a great friend of, of my family and mine. Um, we started doing uh, uh, EVAR for ruptured aneurysms uh, after uh, Frank uh, Vith and Takoki reported the first 12 cases. Um, we started doing it in 2000 when they started doing it in 1994, so we waited to get some of the, uh, some of the background on it. And you just have to be very comfortable uh, with the endovascular technique, but more importantly, you have to have an infrastructure of a hospital that's willing to put the time, the uh, money, and the effort into creating a system. So uh, at our medical center, uh, which is the hub of our hub and sp uh, spoke model, uh, they have a lot of uh, endovascular equipment. We have a hybrid suite, but most importantly, we have well-trained staff, and we have a one number to transfer all patients. So one of the problems, one of the concerns that, that people had was delay in transfer. And the way we got around that is we have a 1-800-vascular number where all, uh, all ERs uh, within our area or even outside our area can call, and the hospital has 100% accept all patients. Uh, policy, uh, and they don't have to start looking for a doctor. They call whoever's on, they call the fellows on call, and then they call the attending on call, 
And if neither one answers in 15 minutes, they call me, which um, makes the life of the people who didn't answer the first two calls uncomfortable. Um, but that's worked ex extremely well in our world. And now hospitals can actually get the patients out of the hospital, uh, out of their ER quickly, and to a hospital where you can take care of the um, patients. Now, ironically, we cover the private hospital a mile down the road, which is the uh, bitter competitor to the medical center. We've even convinced them to transfer their ruptures uh, down the street because it will take two hours in the community hospitals to get the ORs ready. In, uh, in a medical center much as this, you can usually get it done very quickly, especially since you have anesthesia in there 24 hours a day. Um, but as you can imagine, change was hard. The first case we did uh, in Albany, uh, the head of anesthesia pulled me aside and said if I ever did an endovascular repair of a rupture aneurysm again, he'd report me to the state. And then about two years later, when I did an open rupture, he pulled me aside and says, can't you do all of them endovascularly? So, uh, you know, the, you, you sometimes have to get out of your comfort zone to change what we do. And as you, can, as you know, surgeons love to change what they do. Um, one of the things we learned is that when you look at a CAT scan, you know, everybody always thinks endovascular open are, are, uh, are competitors, but they, they, you, we really have to analyze aortas and analyze aortic necks similarly whether you're doing an endovascular or open technique. Because you really, um, you, what we call an endovascular world, a uh, landing zone is where you're going to clamp. And you always want to clamp at a place that's clean, uh, free of thrombus, free of, uh, free of calcium, uh, to have a secure area to sew and, and, and make sure you don't embolize uh, either to the renals or the visceral uh, aorta. Um, so you always clamp in one spot, and you always want to deploy the graft in one spot. So again, when we start teaching people, this is an intellectual process. And as I was talking to George on the way over, is surgeons should not be thinking in the operating room. Surgeons should think before they get to the operating room, have five or six plans ready, and be able to go from A to B to C to D as quickly as possible to minimize the amount of time in the OR. Uh, so, uh, and part of that is your planning, uh, whether it's an emergency or whether it's an elective case. Um, and borrow this uh, slide from Tom Bauer from uh, the Mayo. But you know, not all aneurysms are created the same. And so again, looking at your at your CAT scans, um, you know, this first one you can clamp in for renally. This this one's probably super renally. This may be super renally or super celiac. And the higher you clamp, the complication rate goes up a little bit. But if you really look at a lot of the objective data, uh, the higher uh, going retroperitoneal, especially if you clamp high, uh, the renal complications uh, aren't that high, aren't, aren't any higher. And uh, sewing into good aorta and getting a good anastomosis is much, much more important than sewing, uh, uh, than clamping lower and sewing into bad aorta. And don't forget that even if you clamp inferenally, you decrease your GFR by 25%, so you're really not saving a lot by clamping inferenally. And this is probably one of the concepts that young surgeons have the hardest time with. Um, so before we embarked on our rupture aneurysm uh, approach, we actually looked at 50 CAT scans, and we found two things. Uh, we wanted to find out what percentage of patients would be anatomically suitable for uh, endovascular pair rupture aneurysms. And also, we looked at CAT scans of patients who we had CAT scans for six months before the rupture and then at the time of rupture. And if you all remember, most uh, the SVS guidelines, uh, which I uh, helped review, says that you should operate at 5.5. And we found that 20% of our ruptures were, had aneurysms that were 5 centimeters to 5.5 centimeters. So we've actually become uh, fairly aggressive about any aneurysm over 5 right now. But what we did is we looked at uh, pararenal aneurysms, about 10% of them. About 16% had neck angulation of 60. And um, about 26% and a quarter of them had uh, tortuosity or calcium, we really didn't care much about that, so we kind of ignored that. So when you put it all together, about 75% of the patients anatomically would probably be, be suitable uh, in a non-IFU uh, approach to repairing endovascular aneurysms. One of the other th concepts we kind of left with was that you don't have to have the best uh, and complete uh, seal at the, time of the, uh, at, the, at the time of the operation as we were taught as open surgeons, is you want to uh, have an impeccable, perfect operation when you're finished. Uh, our goal with rupture aneurysms and aortic emergencies is to get the patient off the table. If you have to plan a secondary procedure to uh, fix things, then we would do that, but at least you'd have a, a live patient at the end of it, as opposed to uh, uh, staying in the operating room for an extended period of time. And here you can see some pictures of uh, patients with an endograft and some secondary procedures uh, with coils that you can see, which have helped us out. Now, again, as I mentioned, the first time we did this, I was almost reported to the state of New York uh, for, for 
committing treason. So what we did to make people comfortable, because what we realized early on is we put the right arm out because we were going to get access uh, with an, an aortic balloon through the brachial approach on the right. And in a hybrid street, if you do that, you really box the anesthesiologist in. And that was his real concern when we did this, is that he had a very small area to work. So what we did is in, uh, in 2002, I guess when we started, we, we took patients who had elective aneurysms, even some symptomatic aneurysms, brought them to the ER, pretended they were ruptures, went through the series of, uh, of, of machinations that one would do when a patient came to the ER with a rupture aneurysm. So the ER felt comfortable, the OR felt comfortable, anesthesia felt comfortable, and the uh, nursing staff and the OR staff felt very comfortable. So after doing that for five simulations, we uh, uh, it, was, it, it became second nature to take patients from the ER to the OR, or ER to the CAT scan to the OR in, in most cases. And we developed a, a, a protocol for doing this. Manny Mato, who was working with us at the time, did a great job of, of putting this all together. Um, and most of the patients now have come either with a CAT scan or can get a CAT scan uh, uh, as quickly as possible, and it really doesn't uh, delay their care. I'm not sure if the videos work, but that's all right. So uh, as I mentioned, we simulated the rupture. We believe, uh, much like Frank Vief does, that high potential of hemostasis is important. If you look at Kai Johansson's work from the 80s and early 90s, they had an 80% mortality um, for the ruptured aneurysms. And what it came down to is they looked back at the, ER, the emergent, uh, EMTs uh, and the uh, uh, ER's approach to handling ruptured aneurysms. And what they would do is there was two schools of thought at the time. There was resuscitate in the field, and there was scoop and run. And so when you resuscitate in the field, they found out those patients had a much higher mortality than if you scoop and ran. Uh, so we tell them, uh, as long as the patient's mentating, as long as they're no end organ dysfunction, we tell them just to keep the pressure 60 or 70, you don't really care, just get them to the operating room, because uh, survival correlates directly with control of the bleeding, well, much like trauma. So we just tell them to get, uh, get to the hospital as soon as possible, and we'll take care of the rest, and don't worry about uh, giving them blood or giving them, uh, uh, especially giving them pressors. Uh, so what we do when we, when we saw these patients, we'd get... Um, Unilateral femoral access, there's been a lot of papers now which we do this under local so, so they don't have any hemodynamic compromise when they, when they get inducted. Uh, we place a sheath in and place a balloon, uh, which is sorry, but you would have seen that in this uh, video, uh, in uh, the supraceliac aorta. You don't want it in the paravisceral aorta because of embolization uh, potential. Um, and re in reality, we only do that about a quarter of the time, but at least you have access to do that. Once you have the balloon up there, you can actually put the device up the contralateral side, deploy it, then change the balloon to that side and place the balloon in the graft, uh, and you'll have uh, aortic control that way. And then you complete your uh, endovascular repair. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the patients where the cardiologist thought she was too sick to have an elective aneurysm, so they waited until she ruptured and had a crit of 19, uh, and then they sent her to us. Um, and uh, as you can see, it was a relatively straightforward endovascular repair, which could have been, which would have been nice to do, and not at two in the morning. Um, but we uh, placed an endograft in that, and that's what she looked the first day post-op, which is radically different than all the op open ruptures that I tend to do. Uh, they don't look quite as buffed and cleaned as this lady did. Um, Again, we went through this. We, do, we barely do an aorta uniliac anymore because usually you can cannulate the, 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 uh, the contralateral limbs. The key to that is actually as we watch the sheaths go up, you can tell which direction that the, uh, your guide cath or your marker flush will be so you can cannulate quickly. Uh, I, I think you have to be very cognizant of everything that goes on in, in, in the, an endovascular repair by watching this, the... the um, the way the sheaths slide up, the, the crossing, if they cross, if they don't cross, and the direction they go, which will make life a lot easier. Um, so now we've actually modified our approach to endovascular repair of rupture aneurysms, and we, we'll, we'll take a very short neck if, if we have to. Um, aortic diameter is varying, depending on, on what size graphs you have, and we'll actually go up even higher than 30 right now. This is an old slide. Aortic neck angle, uh, I think it depends more on the horizontal uh, axis and how long that neck is, and it depends on what graft you're going to use. And we really don't care about thrombus or calcium at this point because the goal is just to seal the proximal neck and uh, the distal landing zones and then uh, deal with the complications down the road later. Uh, we've actually written a paper on type 2 endolakes with ruptured aneurysms, and it didn't increase mortality or bleeding, uh, major bleeding complications in our group. So again, one of the things we've also learned is we try not to manipulate the device. Uh, it's really you, you look, you analyze, uh, you figure out what device you want to use and where you want to put it and then deploy it and not get too consumed with 
uh, with being perfect in everything you do. Uh, one of the things my partners always make fun of me that if any patient's not uh, peeing at the time you're doing these operations, it usually means you did something to the kidneys even though you try to convince yourself that you didn't. And we are very aggressive about doing renal revascularizations, even in ruptures if, uh, if they aren't peeing. One of the other things we looked at or figured out is that a patient can be have a pressure of 60, you put a balloon in, you put it up, then they're going to have a pressure of 120. And if you don't pay attention and have somebody holding that balloon, especially on a sheath, that balloon's going to fall back into the middle of your visceral aorta and make it extremely difficult uh, to deploy the graft. Uh, so actually, we stationed somebody holding the sheath the entire time, uh, making sure that with each beat of the heart, that, that, that balloon does not come down. And that's uh, probably one of the more important things we learned uh, in, in doing these uh, interesting operations. Sorry. Oops. My videos are not working, but that's all right. So in this one, you would have, you would have seen, uh, this is about a four, four millimeter neck that we used. Uh, much like the uh, fenestrated grass nowadays, you can actually just get access uh, with a 014 wire into the, into the renal. I'm sorry for not, this is not going to be pleasant then. <laughs> and. Uh, um, it, it would have shown that the, uh, there was good sealing of the aneurysm approximately distally. And so as we became comfortable with this, um, uh, we do about 75% of our ruptures uh, endovascularly at this point, somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters. Uh, and the ones left for open aneurysms are pretty complicated. And we looked at you know, this series, which again is a relatively old series. About a quarter of them were unstable. We had CAT scans on 80%. Now it's close to 95%. Uh, and unfortunately, we came up with a new compli with a complication we had not seen before, which was abdominal compartment syndrome, which if the patient develops abdominal compartment syndrome, the chance of mortality is probably closer to 55%. If they do not have it, it's probably closer to 14%. So that's something we deal with very aggressively and very quickly. Uh, we measure bladder pressures, uh, but more importantly, just look at the belly and see how, how full it looks. And uh, opening them up early, I think is, uh, it helps them in the long run. Uh, again, this, our open practice was about 40 percent, but again, the uh, selection bias, because all the patients who were anatomically unsuitable for endografts uh, went to the open, and those who had uh, endografts had 20 percent. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the world's literature and you look at everything, almost all of them have a mortality of 20 percent, so that's really, I think, the true mortality for doing an endorupture. And this is a patient who had abdominal compartment syndrome. When we analyzed our results from all the abdominal compartment syndromes, we realized that one of the problems with they had an increased INR, they had an increased transfusion requirement, uh, also the unstable patients, which makes sense. And so uh, what we decided is that we're not going to use rupt we're not going to use heparin on any ruptured aneurysms. Uh, and uh, many of the open aneurysms we do, we don't use heparin. So we figured the same thing for endovascular. And again, I think part of that is a process of figuring out exactly where to deploy the graft, having the graft <laughs> stay in the aorta as, as as minimal amount of time as possible, and try to get in and out as soon as soon as possible. But we don't use uh, heparin on most uh, ruptures, especially unstable ruptures right now. And we haven't increased our uh, rate of uh, thrombotic or embolic uh, complications uh, in these patients. Um, so EVAR for rupture, is it a good idea? Um, mo some people uh, still disagree. They've done some prospective randomized trials in, in England and in Europe, and they have not found benefit for it, but um, I, at least in our experience, we think it's really very, very, very useful. Looking at some, again, some of the data uh, around the world, Mary Lashad, again, the 21 percent um, mortality, which I think is very consistent. Um, if you look at some of the other uh, um, papers from uh, Europe, again, 24 percent mortality. And then um, if you look at some of the American literature, what they found that um, EVAR does have more lower mortality, especially not in uh, teaching hospitals. Uh, and again, I think that's more because of infrastructure, more because of support uh, than uh, truly the, the people doing the, uh, the uh, uh, procedures. In our own world, we covered our 16 hospitals, and I've done an open rupture in every, every one of the 16 hospitals, and you can get them through the operation. The problem is you can't, it's hard to get to the operating room, and once you get out of the operating room, the post-operative ICU care may be uh, not as uh, meticulous as, as it is in a place where you have residence fellows and intensivists. Um, and again, if you look at um, uh, McPhee, uh, Jamie McPhee's paper, uh, regionalization actually has, wor has worked when you look at it uh, objectively. And that's really helped us uh, promote our own little world of, uh, of hub and spoke, transfer all the ruptures to one hospital if you can. 
so we cover an area pretty much from Canada down to Westchester, New York, parts of Pennsylvania and parts of Massachusetts. Um, Courtney Warner uh, presented at the American Surgical our, our data of, of doing uh, 421 uh, ruptured aneurysms uh, and, uh, and she subset it in, into those patients uh, who were tr came de novo to the medical center, those patients who went to the community hospital and got transferred, and then those patients that stayed at the community hospital. Um, and you know, this has been done by other groups, uh, Ben Starn's group in Washington, uh, and it's been written, Matt Mel's written about it for Stanford. Uh, and uh, at that point, we only had 19 uh, board certified surgeons, now we're up to 21 and looking for one or two more. Uh, we looked at the 12 hospitals that we, that we had direct control over uh, as far as vascular uh, uh, access uh, and vascular surgery and compared them to the medical center. So when you looked at it, they had about, we did about 451 um, ruptured aneurysms in I think a 12 year, 13 year period. Uh, only 30% went right to the medical center, 70% uh, went to the community hospitals, but 60% of those were transferred to the, to the medical center for us to take care of, and 40 out of 130 still stayed at the outside hospitals. When you looked at it, the ones that were transferred were actually sicker patients, and we, when we looked at this data, we realized that the patients that stayed at the hospital, we thought were the ones that were in, in extremis and or were uh, too unstable to transfer, but it turned out that the, they, most of the outside hospitals kept the patients who showed up from 9 to 5 and who were real, relatively hemodynamically stable, and they transferred the ones that were unstable, which you can make your own judgments on that one. <laughs> and when we looked at it, um, the mortality for the endovascular pairs, again, is this 20%, which just has been consistent throughout the entire literature of doing this. Uh, we did 62% of them EVAR when they came to the medical center. We, we, don't have the, we had some of the ability to do EVAR. We did eight EVARs in, one of the, in the smaller hospitals and had really good results, but again, that was, those were cherry-picked more than they were uh, just all comers. And the open uh, repairs, the 37% mortality, which I guess is, is reasonably good uh, considering that those are all patients that were either type 4 thoracic abdominals or a pair of visceral aortas that, that had ruptured at the time. And that was statistically significant. Now, one of the interesting things when we looked at uh, some of the parameters, whether the crit was low, whether they're hypotensive uh, or unstable, and that really didn't, it didn't impact the mortality of these patients. And um, when we, the, those patients that were transferred had the same mortality as those patients that came de novo to the medical center. So transfer really didn't impact negatively on those patients. When we looked at the transfer time, we got it down to about, a, a, about an hour and a half, or an hour and 20 minutes, which uh, I would argue I could get a patient uh, into the Albany Med OR uh, who lives 100, who was being evaluated 100, and 100 to 150 miles away quicker than I could in one of the community hospitals that's one, one mile down the street. And uh, we proved that again last week when we did an endovascular rupture at the private hospital. It took two and a half hours to get into the operating room. And that's not because they were slow or, or not trying. Uh, and we had a hybrid suite there. It's just that that's just the way the system is in community hospitals. And I haven't worked there for 20 some odd years. I can. I corroborate that every day. Um, and so overall, the ruptured mortality was 20% lower at the tertiary center than it was in the outside center. Again, there's a little bit of a bias because all the ones on the outside center were, were done open for the most part. Uh, but that's the technology and that's the what you have available at those hospitals for the most part and what the, what the nurses and what the staff are comfortable with doing. And I think if you tried doing a, a rushed endovascular repair at those hospitals, the mortality would be similarly high. And so Courtney uh, um, uh, concluded that regionalizations uh, for ruptured aneurysms decreased mortality by about 20%. Uh, and again, when um, the ACS heard this, that's when they started calling us about trying to set up a system of, uh, of triage and around the country, especially for ruptured aneurysms, sending them just to regional areas uh, that uh, would allow you to do uh, endovascular repair, but also would be, allow you to get into the operating room uh, much more uh, uh, quickly than, than you do at other, at other places. And so this has helped us develop the, uh, treatment algorithms, the community hospitals, to expedite triage, which I think is the most important thing. It's not so much even just getting them to the tertiary care center, it's having patients uh, be evaluated quicker, be they made the diagnosis, and be, and be transferred uh, uh, meticulously and really without uh, and seamlessly to uh, the tertiary care center. Because as you know, some of these patients languish in the ER uh, with uh, the thought that they have kidney stones or that they have diverticulitis or some other uh, uh, inter-abdominal process. 
uh, or, or abdominal process that causes the pain. So we've almost, as I was talking to Matt Simon like yesterday, um, some of my partners uh, chastised me because we've gotten people so scared about ruptured aneurysms and vascular disease that if a 21-year-old comes to the emergency room with right rule quadrant pain, they want to rule them out for mesenteric ischemia before they take out his appendix. So we've kind of done our job a little bit too well. Um, so again, it can be, these are all the conclusions which I kind of just reiterated. Uh, now I'm going to go through a couple of uh, cases, and unfortunately the videos don't work, so um, it'll be a little boring for the last one. But this is one that uh, presented a couple of years ago where we, we had a 43-year-old woman with sudden, sudden onset of right uh, flank pain, a white count of 15,000. Uh, CT demonstrated that her right renal was, uh, was thrombosed uh, and infarcted, and being the overly aggressive group that we are, we decided, well, well let's give it a shot and see if we can endovascularly uh, fix this right kidney. Um, the left kidney uh, uh, also had a 99% stenosis, and this is the, just the CAT scan. And we thought we saw a little bit of rim of, of enhancement on that on the right kidney that was infarcted, and we decided we'll, we'll give it a shot. So we crossed the lesion, uh, shot an angiogram, got a beautiful picture, uh, put a covered stent across it, uh, and of course that thrombosed in the next two or three hours. Uh, so we decided she's PM, she's okay, we'll park her for, for the weekend, because I was on call that weekend, and it was a Friday night, and we'll heparinize her, and, and then we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do with the aorta the next day. Um, so, of course, as we're operating on another patient, my fellow tells me that this patient becomes aneuric, um, and as it says here, mistakes, it could be the purpose of your life is to only serve as a warning to others. Uh, we, we tried to figure out what are the options that we had, and at first, uh, the fellow and the residents tried to convince me that this is... Um, uh, just because of dye-induced nephropathy, um, and maybe we should just observe it. Uh, this may be a chronic problem and leave it alone, or should we just run into it and revascularize it? Um, so I t tend to be one of the more aggressive ones in our group, as, as Sean Roddy calls me N plus one, because I tend to do one more operation than I need to every day. And um, so we decided to take this woman to the, uh, to the operating room uh, urgently to see if what was causing her um, lack of urine output is, and when you take people from the, when you look at the aorta from the side, especially from the retroperitoneal side, uh, this woman on the CAT scan, you could see that she had calcifications in the perirenal area. She had a 99% stenosis of the left renal and a, an occlusion of the right. So we thought maybe a trapdoor endarterectomy would be a reasonable thing. And to do that well in from the retroperitoneum, you have to make sure the disease does not extend too far because the SMA dies dives, uh, in, uh, and uh, you have to bring the kidney down if you want to get a, an extensive view of the SMA, and you uh, want to be able to end that endarterectomy uh, quickly uh, in, so that it doesn't dissect as the blood goes down toward the legs. So when you look at it, the right renal artery, which we tend to do a lot of right renal arteries from left retroperitoneal approach, uh, I've done about 300 of them, and um, the left renal artery, as I mentioned, you want to go straight up and down. You make a little semi-square, rectangular, uh, arteriotomy around the disease process. Many times you'll carry that all the way up here into the celiac and just make a big, excuse me for my, make a big uh, rectangle, flip it up, uh, remove all the plaque, and uh, then sew it back together again. So here's a picture of the aorta and the SMA from the retroperitoneal approach. Um, as you can see, the renals bifurcated easily, SMA here. I'm sorry for being so far away. Uh, again, from the retroperitoneal approach with the kidney being uh, pushed anterior encephalad right up here. You open it up, and this is the chunk of uh, calcium and, uh, and thrombus that we pulled out of it. Here's the right, uh, left renal here, the SMA here. The right renal lies on the other side. And you don't have to use any prosthetic Apache. You just can sew it up at that point. I'm sorry, again, right here. You can sew it up without causing any problems. We did put a tacking stitch distally because she did have some atherosclerotic disease. And then it worked, uh, worked reasonably well. And I really wish I could get the um, um, videos to work on this one. So this is the last, last uh, slide I'll show you, or last case I'll, I'll show you, which is one of our well-fed uh, Albanians, as we call them, who's had a prior aortic uh, reconstruction, um, which is now thrombosed. So he has an axillofemoral graft. Um, he had new onset back pain and chest pain. Uh, and was brought to our, uh, transferred to our uh, emergency room with a ruptured thoracic aneurysm. Um, 
So this, uh, you know, we wanted to do this endovascularly because we didn't want to enter his chest again. Uh, we tried to figure out what options we had, so we came up with, we're going to go through his right carotid artery. Oh, this video works, so. And uh, deploy the graft through the right carotid artery. And it was just a cut down on the right side and placement of the graft. This is going around that question mark part of the aorta down toward the uh, celiac axis where we deployed our, our first graft. This is my favorite one where we thought we were out of the woods until we could not get the corner to turn. Oops, hold on. Which, um, sorry. What you realize is these are nitinol-based metals, and if you take it out and you, f and you put it in cold water, and you can actually form it, and it will uh, take that corner a little bit better. But it took us about five minutes to figure that out. And then our final picture, I think. The part I like here is how slow, how low his cardiac output is, and how slow it goes. So the leak, the le you can't see the leaks as well that way. So it made my life a lot better. Uh, so again, it's a little bit of an old slide, but we've um, done about 600 ruptures during this uh, the 13-year period, 450 for uh, for uh, perirenal aneurysms and about 160 for thoracic aneurysms. The mortality has actually been pretty good. And again, I think the reason we have these numbers is because we tr get a lot of patients transferred from, from far away. We've really only lost a handful of patients in, uh, in transit. Excuse me. Um, and so that, the, the, the transfer and referral of those patients really hasn't been a problem. Um, the problem is when they decide they won't transfer the patients because they think they're too unstable. And I would argue, and I always argue very vociferously, that they have a much better shot of surviving if they just get to the hospital as opposed to having one of us go to those hospitals. And there was one instance where they were said they were too unstable to transfer, so I drove 25 miles to do the uh, ruptured aneurysm. I get there, and I'm waiting for 20 minutes for the uh, anesthesiologist to show up. Uh, so the same amount of time it took me to drive up to that hospital, they could have just transferred the patient down, which is a little bit infuriating. But we have, again, EVAR 20% mortality, and this is close to 300 now, uh, endovascular repairs. Open is between 36 and 40. And even for the thoracic aneurysms, which again I think are, are somewhat selected out, 30% mortality for the TVARs and uh, about a 60% mortality for, for the open thoracic aneurysms, which we don't do that much anymore because I think we have great techniques to... Uh, uh, to do them endovascularly, especially with uh, snorkels, et cetera. So in, in conclusion, you know, our, what we've learned from all of this is that emergencies can be sent to a tertiary care hospital, even ischemic emergencies, which I didn't uh, highlight too much. I think one of the more important things we, we've done is have one, one number for the uh, referring physicians and for the ER docs to call, and it, it obviates them having to try to search for a doctor and find out if Dr. Davies is around. <coughs> Dr. Hayter is available. All they have to do is call one number. They know they'll find one of us. Uh, they can always find me. Um, and we have in-house anesthesiologists. There's no delays. I can call anesthesiologists. And with a PAC system now, many of these CAT scans are sent to us before, so we can actually plan the procedure before the patient even gets there. We have our own hybrid suite, which uh, has our own techs involved with it, so uh, we can get them prepared and ready, and uh, we have the devices uh, there to, to do these procedures. And all of our staff are very comfortable with endovascular procedures. We don't have an aortic staff that just comes in, uh, like the cardiac surgeons, but we, most of our staff are experienced, and we do enough elective endovascular repairs uh, that they feel comfortable. And I, again, most importantly, we, all of us, are always available when we're in town to come in and help out, uh, especially someone who's less comfortable doing, uh, uh, doing endovascular. Or more importantly now, everybody's comfortable doing endovascular, but many people are uncomfortable doing open aortic uh, emergencies. And so one of the senior guys, usually ones one of us come in for every open rupture now uh, to assist any of the juniors, junior faculty, uh, and or any of the, the uh, ischemic ones, which are actually a little more complicated to deal with, uh, we come in to help the junior faculty, which makes everybody much more comfortable than staff, uh, the uh, faculty, and the nurses. And so I think if you take the take-home message is really with a standardized team approach, uh, good nurses, uh, not only good nurses and good techs in the operating room, but on the floor. And we have the luxury of having two full floors and our own, our own ICU at the uh, at Albany Medical Center, which we actually run the ICU, so I don't have to deal with any of the trauma, traumatologists taking care of our patients. 
Um, and I think that has helped us a lot, uh, especially with communication with how to take care of these patients <coughs> post-operative. Uh, we try to minimize the use of hammer, hem, uh, heparin in, in unstable patients, and regionalization really has, I think, helped uh, imp improve the mortality uh, of ruptured aneurysms, at least in our, in our part of the world. And one of the beauties of being a, a vascular surgeon and being trained open in endo is that if you have a problem, you can always use a balloon and you can always use a scalpel. Uh, so that's, uh, so we, you know, we're, we're able to do whatever we have to do uh, in whatever room we want to do it in. So thank you very much, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. And thank you again, Mark, for inviting me down to this beautiful part of the world. <laughs> so, getting a private anesthesiologist to a community hospital in 20 minutes is probably worthy of a case report. <laughs> uh, we can't find out who's on call within 20 minutes, that's one of the things. Uh, the thing that intrigues me is uh, establishing a center of excellence is a two-edged sword. Uh, I remember 25 years ago, my good friend Gene Moore at uh, Denver they said that they got their trauma patients to Denver General within 12 to 15 minutes. And we looked at our data here. Uh, the victim would have to be placed in the ambulance, and then the assailant shoot him in the ambulance <laughs> uh, to get him here in that time period. And the problem was resuscitation mm -hmm. in the field and not scoop and run. So that made a big difference. What I'd like to know is how long does it take from all those areas to get the patients here? And what do you think that that affects mortality? No, we, we actually looked at that, and uh, it wasn't so much the transfer, you know, because once the, it's the identification of the problem. You know, with trauma, it's really easy because you got a, you got an entrance wound, you got an exit wound, and with, with aneurysms, especially with rupture aneurysms, again, they may be sitting in the ER for two to three to four hours going looking for some other problem, and then they finally get to you. Um, <coughs> So I, I think we, we actually, when we looked at it, it was an hour, was an hour, 1.2 hours after they identified the problem that we would transfer. And that, you know, depends on how far the, the hospitals were. So they identified them pretty quickly and got them to us very quickly. You, you are exact credit. I, I kind of misspoke. It wasn't, I waited there for 20 minutes. I waited there for, and I didn't start that operation in the hospital for another hour and a half. And that was because of preparing things and waiting for other people. And it would be reportable if you could do it in a community hospital. But I still think... If that patient gets shot and they try to transfer him to community hospital, he's going to have to wait an hour and a half with somebody either holding his groin or doing something else. And so going to a, uh, a center where they can go to the OR right away is, is important. Now, the real problem we ran into is that we have these two bitter hospitals that compete against each other. And when we started transferring all of the ruptures to another hospital, NISQIP doesn't designate ruptures as any different from elective aneurysms. Mm -hmm. So the mortality and complication rate for the, the uh, tertiary care hospital looked terrible compared to the private hospital which they were competing with. So I, I, I got you know, pulled to the uh, board of directors at the, at the medical center trying to explain why our data is so bad, whereas St. Peter's looks so good. And that was, uh, that was a challenging thing. I basically had to tell them that you know, if it was your mother or your grandmother and she had a rupture aneurysm, wouldn't you want them to go to a hospital where the mortality was better than if staying at a hospital uh, where she's going to probably die? And, you know, they finally accepted that and kind of ate the complications and said, we'll, we'll deal with the, the flak that as it comes. But that was actually one of the harder things to do. Um, but gunshot wounds actually, you know, again, either die in the field or you're going to survive, or you have a good chance of surviving. And then looking at our data, it's, you know, eight, like I said, almost 11% mortality, which is a third of what you get for ruptured aneurysms. Any questions for Dr. Darling? Yeah, I would not correct it at all. Uh, just take them to the CAT scan, because again, you know, uh, survival it correlates to getting control of that aorta, either with a clamp or with a balloon. Um, now, don't dawdle and don't sit there for a while, but you just want to scan them quickly. You want to see the aortic neck, maybe see what, what you can for access. If you can't do it, then he goes to an open room. If, you, if, he, if it looks like it's amenable to an endograph, we put him in the, end, in the hybrid suite. But we just, you know, that, that helps you a lot, because I hate to admit this embarrassing thing that's happened for the first time, I think, in the last 20 years, is I get called from one of the outside ERs that they have somebody with a positive fast, 
uh, you know, belly, big belly. They have fluid everywhere in his abdomen. And he comes to the ER, his pressure's 70. I said, can you get, just get a CAT scan? He said, no, no, he's too unstable. Turns out he had 12 liters of ascites and no, no aneurysm, uh, which I documented by my left hand. But um, uh, he had pancreatitis or some other problem, which is not vascular, but just irritated me. But, you know, I'd much rather have, that guy would have been much better served by having a CAT scan instead of worrying about his pressure at 70, you know. Because, you know, as at most ORs now, when you come to the ER, you go to the thing, there's a CAT scanner right next to the, the trauma bay, and then you go to the OR. And then it's really a five-minute deal, a ten-minute deal. And if they transfer for an hour, they should be able to tolerate another ten minutes unless they're doing CPR. So permissive hypotension is a great idea. Absolutely. And it was a tough concept to wrap your brain around. Usually we're having people with ruptured spleens come in, hypotensive. They'd get two or three liters in the ER, and all of a sudden they started bleeding again and had to be rushed yeah. emergently to the OR. So. Dr. Seidman. Hey, great, great talk. Um, so you mentioned that you have supplies available. So how many boys do you have? Uh, <laughs> I always tell people, you know, dealing with surgical egos is tough. Dealing with hospital egos is way tougher. Um, so I played a little bit on their egos for setting up the system. We have four different companies worth of graphs and probably $2 million worth, but all, most of them are on consignment. So I got them on consignment on the industry side, and I got the hospital to give us a place to put them all on the other side. So it was, you know, basically... You know, as I mentioned, we two of the rival companies we run. We used to run rupture workshops. For them. Uh, I prefer actually the the, the PTFE type graphs because they're less porous than the than the Dacron graphs, and it's a little easier to, to um, deploy. Uh, but that's my own personal preference. So we was basically working with them together. So the hospital just doesn't want to spend money, and that's you know they don't. And I wouldn't say they don't care about the mortality and mortality, but they're more concerned about the bottom line. So if I got the companies to to agree to consignment, then everybody was happy. Um, Dr. Gomez, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. One of the questions I have is you discussed a lot of simulations. Mm -hmm. um, what device did you use? Uh, was the actual procedure part something that you simulated since there is physical device here? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's not so much the simulator that it was. It was the team simulation that was much more important. Uh, so we didn't, it's not that I had people um, go to a simulator to do endovascular repairs, because we do so many, and we, you know, we do a lot of endovascular. It's, what we would do is we would take a regular elective case, and we'd say, if this is a ruptured aneurysm, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put a 12 French sheath on the left side, an 18 on the right. We're going to put the balloon up. This is how you control the balloon. This is how you do it. So the scrub nurse knows what you do. The OR tech knows what you do. The angio knows what you do. We simulated the whole process. So we brought the patients down to the emergency room from the beginning and said, OK, this is, this is a ruptured aneurysm. What are you going to do? And so you have to get the buy-in of the patients and they sign consents and all. So we went down there. The ER got to evaluate them. They figured out how long it took to, to get them from there to the CAT scan to the, uh, to the OR. And then once you're in the OR,